This is the fourth in a series of lectures giving an introduction to exterior differential systems. In this lecture, I want to, uh, to think about almost complex structures and to think about the, 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 the old theorem that uh, torsion-free almost complex structures are complex. So we'll have to explain what's an almost complex structure and see what the theorem says. An almost complex structure on an even dimensional real manifold. So M here is an even dimensional real manifold and an almost complex structure is a complex structure on each tangent space. That means each tangent space of M is a complex vector space. So M itself might not be complex but each tangent space is somehow made into a complex vector space and this is a smoothly varying complex structure in the tangent spaces. What does that mean? Uh, it means that if we take for example a complex scalar and a smooth vector field we can multiply the complex scalar by the smooth vector field and get a smooth vector field. And that'll make sure that it's a smoothly varying complex structure in tangent spaces. And the, the tricky bit is that it's not always the case that such a thing arises from a complex structure on M. And that's what we want to, to look for. A complex co-framing is a choice of complex linear one forms. They're complex linear, complex valued one forms. So each of these omegas, omega one to omega n, each one of them is a one form valued in the complex numbers, and it's complex linear on each tangent space. And we ask that the, this be um, that this be a, a basis for the one forms for the complex valued, complex linear one forms. So these should give complex linear coordinates on each tangent space. And we'll write the vector valued form omega to mean uh, the form whose entries are whose, whose entries down a column are omega 1 to omega n so it's convenient to have a, a vector valued single simple uh, single symbol for all these omega n's put together into a single column okay so if m were a complex manifold we want to be able to see some special condition happening with the complex co-framings and then we'll try to set up an exterior differential system to see if that works um, so we're going to say then if M was a complex manifold, there's a particular special choice we could make for the omega mu's. You could choose a complex co-framing by taking holomorphic coordinates z mu and letting omega mu simply be the dz mu's. So that way we would get um, a complex co-framing that was not only complex but also in fact holomorphic. However, if you're handed an almost complex manifold and you don't know whether or not it's complex, you won't know whether or not it has holomorphic coordinates, and so you won't be able to do this. You won't be able to pick omega mu to be dz mu because you won't know what any choice of z mu's are. So how do we make use of this? If we picked any complex co-framing, any complex co-framing at all, uh, you pick one and I pick another one, yours and mine must be the same up to complex linear change of variables at each at each point. So yours are complex linear multiples of mine and vice versa. So if the, you pick any complex co-framing omega mu's and I happen to somehow know this is a complex manifold and I manage to somehow pick holomorphic coordinates and take dz mu's, yours and mine will still be related. Any omega mu complex co-framing must be uh, a sum of complex coefficients times dz's, some coefficients g mu nu's times dz nu's. And here, as often in these lectures, we'll use the Einstein convention that uh, an upper and lower index are meant to be summed over. So the subscript nu and a superscript nu appearing here are meant to indicate that there's a sum. So it's a sum of g mu nu, dz nu, sum over nu. And this would have to be true if you had any complex co-framing omega mu. It must somehow be, uh, for some for or for any holomorphic coordinates z mu, there must be some way of picking these g mu nu's to make omega be of that form. So what we have to do is to decide uh, whether or not uh, our omega could look like that. If we take exterior derivative of both sides of that, so omega mu is g mu nu dz nu, if that were to happen, we take exterior derivative, we find that d omega has no omega bar wedge omega bar terms. In other words, when you expand out the exterior derivative in omegas and omega bars, you don't get an omega bar wedge omega bar terms. So, and, uh, so what we're saying is if I took omega mu of the form, g mu nu dz nu, and took exterior derivative of both sides, 
then you can check that it wouldn't get, get any omega bar, omega bar terms when you expanded omegas and omega bars. It's called torsion-free. Uh, the, the complex co-framing is torsion-free if it has no omega bar, omega bar terms in, in its exterior derivative d omega. And so we found that if you have a complex manifold, then every complex co-framing on the complex manifold is torsion-free. This gives us a test. If you are handed an almost complex manifold and you, you pick, you're somehow able to pick a complex co-framing, then you can check to see whether or not it has any torsion. If it has torsion, you know this is not a complex manifold. But if it doesn't have torsion, you don't know. So far, we don't know. So the theorem we're going to try and prove is that a complex man an almost complex manifold is torsion-free if and only if it's a complex manifold. Okay, so what we want to do is assume we have a torsion-free almost complex manifold and prove it's complex because the other direction we've already proven that a complex manifold is torsion-free. So what we have to do is show that a torsion-free almost complex manifold is complex. Suppose we're given a torsion-free almost complex manifold. I call it M. We're going to pick some complex variables, nothing to do with the manifold, just some independent variables, little w and capital W mu's, and we're going to build an exterior differential system which is not on the manifold M. It's on manifold M crossed with the complex numbers, coordinate little w, and then a copy of the complex numbers with a coordinate w mu for each mu. Mu is 1 to n here. Um, so we've got this much bigger manifold, and on that manifold we're going to construct this exterior differential system, the system generated by the, the, the one forms d, the one form dw minus w mu omega mu. And again, there's an Einstein convention on mu there that that's summed over. So it's really the sum of the w mu omega mu's. We're going to see why that exterior differential system will allow us to construct complex coordinates. Uh, let's see how that works. So there's our, our new manifold. Instead of M, we're working with M crossed various copies of the complex numbers. And on that new manifold, we're going to using this exterior differential system generated by a single complex valued one form. And if you like, you could say it's generated by the real and imaginary parts of that one form. But we won't do that because it's a bit messy algebraically. Let's look at the, at the characters. I'll leave you to check what is d theta. So theta was that, that one form. If you take its exterior derivative, you can pack it all, all of its non-omega terms over to, into, the, into the left side of this story, in these pi's, and then these omega terms. Each, each term has a factor of omega because there are no omega bar which omega bar terms. Everything expands into omegas and omega bars, but there's no omega bars. So we find rather easily, uh, besides, the, of course, there are D uh, capital W's showing up there, one in each of those columns. But, uh, but it's fairly easy to compute out what it looks like to find those pi's, so I leave that for you. And you find that you have one pi in each column. And the, so the grades in this example are exactly the columns, grade 1, grade 2, and so on. Uh, however, those are complex valued forms, so we have to be a bit careful about this. And I leave you also to reconsider, to consider how, do, how does this split into real and imaginary parts. If you were to split up the pi's into the real imaginary parts, split up the omegas into the real imaginary parts, how would you rewrite this in terms of real, ima in terms of real imaginary parts as, as, as a larger matrix? Um, so then you can see rather easily that the characters compute out to be just double what you'd expect from the complex picture. What we, so we see here are complex valued forms. It looks like there's one uh, pi in each, in each column. But in fact, there's really two because it has real and imaginary parts. And so you get S1 is 2, S2 is 2, and so on, Sn is 2. So we can see the tableau here. We can calculate out the characters. And so uh, because it's real and imaginary parts, we have 2 for each. Okay, Each pi gives us a real and imaginary part, so 2 uh, con contribution to the characters. Okay, now we'd have to then work out what are the integral elements, at least the ones on which the pi's are multiples of the omegas. We don't worry about the other integral elements. We're just going to worry about these ones. Um, so that'll give us enough integral elements to, to check near one, the ones we want to study, which it might be, say, at p equals 0. So, uh, so we write an integral elements, pi is p times omega, and we calculate out, plugging that into our, to our tableau, what do the p's have to satisfy in order to make the tableau work out to, be, to have 0 for, the, uh, for the, the form d theta. If you compute that out, you find simply that the, 
the p mu nu's have to be symmetric, and so you get some number of complex constants, and so twice that number of real constants, and then you just count out and see that that's an involution. So that means that we've got an involutive exterior differential system, so it has integral manifolds through each integral element. And the integral elements turn out to correspond to uh, to choices of the um, of the differentials, so we get lots of integral manifolds, and that's really important here. That the uh, the differentials omega mu uh, times uh, sorry w mu omega mu those those can be chosen arbitrarily because we get integral elements through every point. We get integral elements through all the little w's and capital w's, and so we get um, arbitrary differentials for a function for a holomorphic function little w. So the integral manifolds correspond, the integral manifolds on which the omegas are non-zero, are, are independent, uh, correspond to uh, making little w a holomorphic function on the complex manifold m. And uh, those can be arranged to have arbitrary differentials. And that's really important here. The fact that the w mu's didn't show up anywhere in the, in the computation of the, of the count of the, of, the, of the characters means that you can specify them arbitrarily and you'll get an integral element there. So that means we can construct holomorphic functions with arbitrary differentials. And so we can construct them to have independent differentials. We can have not just one integral manifold, but several with independent differentials, as many as we like, up to n. So therefore, we can construct holomorphic coordinates, not just one integral manifold, but, but uh, n integral manifolds within different differentials, representing functions with different differentials at a point. And so we get holomorphic coordinates. So that finally gives us that an exterior differential system can easily be used to calculate that torsion freedom implies complex. So torsion free, almost complex structures are precisely complex structures. This is uh, easy, an easy example because you can just see across a row a single uh, bunch of pies and count them very quickly. Uh, the bad news is that, of course, it, it only works in the analytic category, this proof. Um, so in order to prove the result for more general, less smooth, uh, almost complex structures, rough ones, you have to work a lot harder. Still, this at least uh, gives us a motivation for starting to try and work harder. Once we can guess that torsion-free and complex should correspond and see that it's true in the analytic category, we have a strong motivation to try and go and actually do some analysis of PDEs. So it, that's, this is a typical phenomenon in exterior differential systems. We find that there's an easy case where we can calculate some nice result, but we only can do it in the analytic category. And then we're actually motivated to try and see if this same result can be somehow proven in a broader category. So next time, we'll think about how to construct uh, some more sophisticated examples.